Imagine building a city for a million people every week for the next 40 years. Imagine what that would take. Medellin, Colombia. Colombia isn't the largest country in South America, and Medellin isn't even the largest city in Colombia. But there's something happening here that's made it a window into the future of cities. Es un sitio donde puede uno tardear muy seguro. Que es un paraíso, no porque sea mi barrio, pero es un paraíso. Wilson Mejia and Ángela Puello aren't just small business owners. They're participants in an unusual urban experiment, one that's happening in a place whose past might never lead you to believe it'd be a model for the future. The city with the highest murder rate in the world. If you know anything about Colombia's second largest city, it's probably that in the 80s and early 90s, Medellin was headquarters for a homicidal drug cartel headed by Pablo Escobar. And the bombings and bloodshed from the drug trade regularly spilled into the streets. In Colombia, the murders continue in the cocaine capital of Medellin. 40 deaths have been reported there in the last 24 hours. Some of the worst violence plagued Medellin's slums. For decades, these makeshift neighborhoods were hacked out of outlying hillsides by migrants who were too poor to find homes in the city center. Perhaps the most notorious of these was Santo Domingo, where Wilson Mejia lived when he was a kid. No había ley. <laughs> Me tocó ver mucha violencia, o sea, mataban mucha gente, dos, tres muertos, casi diario, eh, persecuciones, tiroteos. Wilson's family first arrived when he was three years old, joining one of many waves of rural migrants who flocked to Medellin. Some were pushed from the countryside by Colombia's decades-long civil war. Others were pulled by the promise of better jobs, but the only place they could live were the illegal shanty towns beyond the reach of police or city services. Eh, pues no contamos con agua que llegaba directamente a la tubería, tocaba ir a buscarla. En barrios cercas, donde donde por todavía eh, nacimientos de agua, era imposible uno venirse. And yet the city continued to be overwhelmed by newcomers. In five decades, Medellin's population exploded from 300,000 people to nearly 3 million. And Medellin's story is in many ways the whole world's story. Our planet is moving to town, and faster all the time. It took more than 10,000 years from the dawn of human settlement to 1800 for the human population to become just under 3% urban. By 1950, we were 30% urban. And by 2050, some projections say 70% of humanity will end up living in cities. So if there's a legacy for the future generations, is the fact that they'll be living in cities. So what cities? What kind of cities? And many of the new arrivals will end up making their living in the informal, hand-built shanty towns that are sprouting in cities across the developing world. Often, you're talking about 50%, 60% of the people living informally. So we are not talking about the exception, right? So the city is that. The population living in slums in the large cities in the Global South represent, at this very moment, a billion people. Wilson's family eventually left Medellin as the city became more violent. But many more migrants kept coming, and many of them arrived during an economic downturn when Medellin's factories were in decline and the drug trade was on the rise. The city was at the point of collapse. It was that serious. Hubo mucho miedo. Se la ciudad se estaba desgranando. But contrary to the expectations of many observers, the crisis in Medellin forced a change. Voters fed up with the violence elected a series of reformist mayors who joined with activists, urban planners, and business owners to invest heavily in upgrading some of the poorest informal neighborhoods to connect them with the rest of the city. The key policies bridged this psychological divide between the city center and the very poor communas in, on the hillsides, which were fairly detached from the city. One of the most innovative of these policies bridged this gap literally. Medellin had built an above-ground metro system to help people get around the middle of town, down on the valley floor. 
And nine years later, they added these. Building a cable car from the city center to the poorest neighborhood, Santo Domingo, in the hills, was hugely significant in crossing this psychological barrier. It's among the first in the world to be used for urban mass transit, and it was part of a multi-billion dollar campaign to knit the property and the people of informal neighborhoods into the formal city. At times, as much as a quarter of Medellin's budget came from a publicly owned power utility, which drew money from all over the region to upgrade city slums. In addition to the cable car, there were other crucial investments that provided additional opportunities to people. Schools for the kids, libraries, microcredit. If we are to look at the cost, there were probably eight times as big as the cost of building the first cable car. Thirteen years ago, the recovery convinced Wilson to move back to Medellin. Just down the hill from the new Metro Cable Station, he and Ankala opened two bars and a restaurant on the same street. Una vez que arrancó el proyecto del Metro Cable, eh, la administración eh, empezó a colocar diferentes oficinas aquí, como la Casa de Justicia, como inspecciones, muchas, muchas entidades. Entonces acá nosotros no, no le damos cuenta a, a grupos ni nada, sino que eh, nos regimos por, por la administración de la alcaldía. Angela's younger sister, Karen, she helps out at the restaurant. And she rides the cable car every time she commutes to nursing school. Mi pensamiento acerca de, pues, de estar viviendo en Medellín cambió después cuando me decidí a vivir acá, a estudiar. Para mí hoy en día Medellín es un lugar lleno de muchas posibilidades. Today, urban researchers from around the world have studied how Medellin upgraded and connected its shanty towns to the formal city. The lessons are easy enough to understand, but they may not be as easy to replicate. It boils down to politics, basically, and the political will to create cities without slums that accommodate low-income people, that accommodate growth. Cities are where the economic activity of a nation occurs if the cities are well-functioning and well-run. Perhaps the most fundamental change is how Medellin has accepted that informal settlements and the people who live there aren't marginal to the city's success. They're essential to it. Over time, and this is a basic principle of law, over time, people get rights. Había mucha gente que antes le daba pena decir que pertenecían a Santo Domingo. Ahora viven orgullosos. The changes have allowed the Mejia family to find their own ways to make the neighborhood a little better. They employ a couple of people. They offer food deliveries to busy neighbors. And for folks looking to relax, there's now a spot close to the metro station where you can grab a drink with friends, hear live music, or watch the game. <laughs> Por supuesto que es el mejor par de Santo Domingo. Entonces ha vuelto un referente del barrio. It's not rocket science. We know what to do. We have the knowledge about how you lay pipes. We know how to set up transportation systems. But can you get places to do it? That's the question. Even here, success remains fragile. Workers may be laying foundations for new metro cable lines in Medellin's more established neighborhoods. But just up the valley, new shanty towns are growing. Residents of this one, called Nueva Jerusalén, face many of the same challenges the Mejia family did decades ago. They pay an armed gang for plots of illegally occupied land. Homes are built by hand and a lot of freight comes in on foot. Esa es la Nueva Jerusalén. 
The old way of thinking about slums was that they were a problem, an intractable, horrible problem that had to be dealt with by eliminating them. But the reality is that they're the solution. And if they're given the opportunity to contribute, they will be the key to sustainable cities in the future.